um, I'm Christine Albert uh, from Cedar sinai Medical Center, and I have here today Dr. Jeff Healy from McMaster, um, and we are going to be talking about his wonderful new randomized trial, Artesia, that uh, us electrophysiologists have been waiting for for a long time, looking at subclinical AF in pacemaker and defibrillator patients. Jeff, welcome. Hey, thanks, Christine. Great to talk. Yeah, so uh, we're really excited to see the results today. I've, probably most of the audience has seen it, but can you just go over the headline results for everybody? Right, so this was a, a population of patients who had device-detected atrial fibrillation on a pacemaker or a defibrillator lasting between 6 minutes and 24 hours, and we randomly assigned them to receive aspirin or apixaban at the standard dose, and we looked for the occurrence of stroke or systemic embolism. And the main result was that uh, apixaban was associated with a 37% reduction in, in stroke or embolism, including a 49% reduction in the large disabling strokes uh, measured by a Rankin score of 3 to 6. Yeah, pretty exciting. Was it what you expected to see? You know, it, I was hopeful that we would see a moderate reduction in all-cause stroke, which is what we saw. Uh, I was a little surprised uh, that there was such a large proportion of disabling strokes, about 45% of all strokes were disabling. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, on the bleeding side, uh, we did see an excess of bleeding. We looked at it two ways using on-treatment analysis where there was an 80% increase in the risk of bleeding, which was about a third increase of bleeding on the uh, intention to treat. And again, this was similar, in fact it was even lower than I would have predicted based on earlier trials like Aristotle, um, uh, despite the fact that this was a very old population. The bleeding risk was lower, although clearly higher with the fix of that. And also, can you tell the audience a little bit about sort of the absolute risk? So when you're looking at a patient in the office, what did you find with regards to what was their risk of stroke sure. and how much you were able to reduce it? So it's early days of the trial. We only closed out about 12 weeks ago. And uh, so the overall risk of stroke uh, on the aspirin-treated arm was 1.34% per year. It's kind of in that middle, right? So traditionally with Chad's VASC and such risk stratification schemes in clinical atrial fibrillation, we set the bar somewhere between one and one and a half percent per year stroke risk for initiating therapy. So this is right in the middle. And, uh, and this is, uh, you know, across the board. Uh, we will be doing analyses to be presented in the upcoming months, looking at particular subgroups. Uh, I think we all have a good idea of certain subgroups, older individuals, those with higher CHADS VAS scores, uh, certainly those with prior stroke or embolism will be of particular interest because we assume that they will have higher risk of stroke. But uh, overall, this was in that middle range between one and one and a half percent per year. And it's also really important to point out that you were very rigorous about once a patient got 24 hours of AF or clinical AF, they went off the protocol and they went into anticoagulation. So this really is that window of 6 to 24 hours where we just don't know what to do. Yeah, so that, that's a good way to frame it, Christine. I mean, it's really, we asked the specific question, what to do for these patients? We know that over one and a half years, about one in four patients went on to develop episodes of over a day or clinical atrial fibrillation. And that's a zone where we think largely the risk is understood, the risk benefit of treatment is in favor of treatment, and in our earlier trials like ASSERT where the stroke risk was higher in the neighborhood of 2.75% per year, so a much right. higher risk population. So it's really coned down on what to do today. Do we treat today or do we continue to monitor uh, probably more intensively uh, for the development of atrial fibrillation, which does occur in one in four individuals over the short term. And is there any, the bleeding risk was, was significantly elevated. Um, is there any way to moderate that? I mean, you yeah. know, that's always been the Achilles heel. We know that, well, now we know that uh, oral anticoagulation reduces the risk with short episodes of AF, but we also get that bleeding risk. And so, did you do anything to select patients that might be at a lower risk of bleeding? Um, maybe talk to the audience about sure. that. Sure. So, I mean, I think there are a couple parts to this. Obviously, we all look forward to the future of new agents, and we've seen presentations here today about new agents uh, that show much less bleeding. So that obviously could have direct bearing on this discussion here today. What do we do in the here and now? Um, I think the biggest single thing we do in clinical practice, and this is based on evidence, uh, is we, uh, as much as possible, avoid the use of concomitant aspirin on top of an anticoagulant because uh, across many studies we see no benefit in terms of preventing embolic events, uh, but roughly a doubling in the rate of major bleeding. So that's the single most important thing, in my opinion, is to prevent the use of unnecessary uh, additional aspirin on top of an anticoagulant. 
Um, and can you speak to that in the trial? Sure. If somebody, how many times did patients continue their aspirin yeah. and then were randomized? So they might have been randomized to dual. Um, sure, and I can give a partial response to this. So at the time of randomization, uh, two-thirds of the patients were taking antiplatelet agent and uh, we allowed single open label antiplatelet on top of study therapy because you know people had firm uh, strong beliefs about what needed to be done right. um, over time that steadily decreased so right at the time of first study drug uh, this had already gone down to around 20 percent by the end of study it was around 10 percent you know based on evolving medical literature and i think you know this needs to be unpacked in a detailed way to understand you know, what was the bleeding rate for those who received open-label aspirin because, as I mentioned, overall the bleeding rate intention to treat 1.4 percent per year, you know, that's much lower. Um, Aristotle was 2.1 percent per year and these patients in, in Artesia are much older. They're about right. seven years older and uh, should have had a higher rate of bleeding, but they didn't. So something's changing. And how do you think, talk about the enrollment, how do you think the um, population was representative? Sure. Because in clinical trials, obviously, we all have our biases about who we want to put in a clinical trial or not. Do you think that this represents most patients with SCAP or how, how do you think it falls into play? So this is a little bit of a longer answer. So the two groups of patients who are underrepresented, we have great comparator registries like ASSERT and TRENDS and many others. Uh, we saw a slight underrepresentation of people with a history of stroke. So instead of 12% as predicted, it was around 9% in both our trial as well as no AF. Mm -hmm. And that's probably bias in terms of people not wanting to enroll because Again, it's, it's very funny to look back 10 years. Um, there were many patients that could have been enrolled where their physicians said, hey, too high risk, I want to treat with an anticoagulant. So under-representation of prior stroke and TIA, under-representation of women. We went right. from 64% women in the observational studies, like ASSERT, uh, down to 36% in both ASSERT as well as NOAA. And that, that really requires some unpacking to understand how that happens, because clearly these were many of the same centers, same investigators, uh, but it, that's a very dramatic difference in the proportion of women. But I think overall, you know, the design of the trial led to some lowering of the rates because, again, once they hit 24 hours, unlike NOAA, right. they came off study drug and they went on an open label anticoagulant. That will lower the rate. But I think overall, the, the patient population was probably selected for lower risk. Why? We see not only a lower risk of stroke than in assert, we see a lower risk of bleeding than in comparator trials. Uh, we haven't presented in great detail, but there's actually a lower risk of mortality, both cardiovascular mortality and non-cardiovascular mortality compared to our other trials. So I think we did select lower risk patients for the study. So I think, you know, we'll need to understand that when it comes to guidelines to understand, you know, is this really a 1.34% per year stroke risk in real practice, right. or is this a specific issue in this, uh, it could this even study? could greater, yeah. So speaking about how you start a trial years ago, um, when did you start? Yeah, so if you really want, when we started pursuing the question, uh, was literally my first year on faculty, 2001. Oh, wow. And this was with Artesia. We asked the question, we saw this in one third of our patients, and the question was, does it matter, right? It was new information, the new devices were giving us, you know, initially small amounts and then big amounts of data on this. And, you know, the first question was, is this a risk? Right. And, you know, a search showed that, yes, indeed, it's a two and a half fold risk, but we knew even then that this was going to be a lower risk scenario, right? It's not a five fold increase like Framingham right. showed, uh, but a two and a half fold increase and so lower risk. And then the next question is, does, does it benefit from therapy? We started to try and get a trial off the ground back before the DOACs hit, hit the scene and virtually nobody would agree to enroll a patient. They said, listen, I'm not going to go in a vitamin K antagonist trial here yeah. because it's too much of a hassle. That spun around on its head literally over the course of the next uh, few years with the introduction of the DOACs because then people say, well, I'm not so sure. It's just so easy to treat with a DOAC. Maybe we should just treat it. It looks like atrial fibrillation. Right. And now we're here with not one but two large clinical trials, a lot of data, and uh, you know we need to see uh, where we go from here. But yeah. it's really interesting how yeah. um, you know at first it was you know patients are not high enough for us to enroll, and then it was you know I want to treat them. So that's right. Uh, interesting. Full and circle. also, that probably, talk about the choice of using aspirin as your control sure. arm. That also probably evolved over yeah. time, right? And, and here you'll see some difference again between the two large trials. So two-thirds of our patients took aspirin or another antiplatelet or even dual antiplatelet at baseline. So 
you know, that was the logical comparator since, you know, we were not going to expect people to stop aspirin if they'd had a coronary stent or an MI or something like this. So that made sense. And uh, furthermore, um, you know, this, this um, was also part of the guidelines, particularly in North America. We had still in North America guidelines for the use of aspirin for atrial fibrillation and those with lower risk. So many people said, okay, you know, for back in the day, a CHAD, a low CHAD score patient treat with aspirin, right? That was in the North right. American guidelines. The European guidelines, like, like Arteza was a North American and European trial. NOAA was a European trial. And the European guidelines had abandoned the use of aspirin for atrial fibrillation much earlier than we did here in right. North America. And so that, that opened up a little bit of space. But in, in North America, it was very hard uh, to convince investigators to randomize a patient to no therapy because they said, listen, worst case scenario, this is low risk atrial fibrillation and you know we, we kind of like using aspirin. It's pretty straightforward. So that's that's why the difference between the two trials. Interesting, interesting. And tell us about what kind of analyses might be coming up for the yeah. audience. What, yeah, what you, I mean, you have a treasure trove of data now that we can uh, yeah, look No, through. it's going to be very good. So first and foremost, later today, uh, I encourage everyone to come back for the in-depth session because we will be presenting uh, some of the summary meta-analysis. We did a, a nice collaboration with the NOAA group to present the summary of the overall results, and I'll leave that for the 3.30 session so everyone shows up. Okay. Uh, but clearly, what's going to come out? Uh, Chad's VASC is going to be looked at in detail, as well as newer types of risk models, right? So we have right. not only Chad's VASC factors, we have echo data, we have all the wealth of the episode duration and burden data uh, to look at, you know, making for this type of atrial fibrillation at the lower end risk of the spectrum right. you know you know it may you know it's it's maybe a complete rethink of how we do stroke uh, risk stratification, particularly in this group of patients, because right. you know never before in a clinical AF trial have you had data on what is the burden of atrial fibrillation measured systematically in all patients. So uh, that that will be one. Uh, what else will come up? Uh, clearly, we're going to look at the aspirin effect. That's very important. Clearly, we're going to unpack the question of what is the duration? Is there an inflection point at some duration or some burden of atrial fibrillation where risk goes up appreciably? Because I think, as you mentioned in your uh, your discussion here at the at the sessions uh, you know this will be really important for guideline committees to weigh in on because we're getting to a group where uh, overall there appears to be some benefit but at some cost and, and which specific patients are we going to be treating now versus which specific patients will we wait to see progression uh, to longer episodes I know I, I think it's great that you're going to be doing all that we're going to be relying on you to do all that and what do you think now though for the for the people slogging through pacemaker clinic and you know you find somebody with 10 minutes of atrial fibrillation mm. what would be your approach yeah so I think the first important thing is you can't ignore it yeah okay so uh, there was some discussion after uh, earlier presentations at ESC this year that maybe we don't have to worry about this and I think it, that's a clear no whether or not you believe everybody should be treated or which patients should be treated I think the clear message is you have to pay attention because some of these patients will require treatment and many of these patients up to one in four in the short term will progress to much longer episodes uh, where we think treatment is more obvious so first and foremost uh, you can't ignore it second there is going to be benefit right overall in a relatively low risk population there was clear statistical evidence of benefits so what that means is there are going to be groups of patients in here uh, where the numbers tilt favorably in terms of delivering therapy, even with shorter episodes. Is it 10 minutes? I don't know. Yeah, um, I know. You know maybe in someone who had a stroke last week or a year ago. Um, you know, it'll be an intersection between clinical factors, uh, arrhythmia factors, and maybe even echocardiographic factors. But I think uh, the most important thing is this is now with us. Uh, both trials will work hard over the coming year or two to uh, unpack all the evidence, and uh, it's going to be timely with the introduction of new guidelines to understand how yeah, this fits. But this is this is really a uh, I think a big step to show that actually it does matter to treat some of these patients, and uh, time will tell and guidelines will tell uh, where the lines will be drawn. Great. All right, well, I think that we've, uh, anything else you'd like to tell the audience about no, the trials? I think is, uh, it's a very exciting area, and uh, we still are a little unsure of what to do, but it, uh, we know we have to do something, and we have to figure out which groups might be the targeted uh, areas. So I want to thank you and thank the audience. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Good yeah, to see you. Good to see you.